guys. Thank you very much. Our pleasure. All right, then. Um, Luther asked the question after he's talked through what the Lord's Supper is. Um, he asked the question, what is the, the benefit of it? And, of course, um, the, the key factor in here is the forgiveness of sins. Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood, for the forgiveness of your sins. Again, just taking Jesus at his word, we believe then that he is conveying to us the forgiveness of our sins through his body and blood and with and under the bread and the wine. Um, and uh, Luther goes on to talk about life and salvation. Um, that um, when you have the forgiveness of sins, you have life, you have salvation. So his, his point here is that um, receiving the body and blood of Christ is the same as, uh, as, as everything else that we talk about is, is coming to us um, by virtue of the faith that God has given to us as a gift. Uh, it, you're not receiving a different thing than you receive by hearing the word of God and believing it. You're not receiving a different thing than you receive when you're baptized. It's the same thing. You're receiving the forgiveness of your sins, the promise of eternal life. Uh, faith in Jesus Christ is, is, is bringing all of these things to you. So, um, it's... Um, It's not like you need three different things and so they come to you three different ways. You need the same thing, but it comes to you in different ways because your situation is different. For example, um, my sin can make me just feel dirty. Just feel like I've wallowed in the pig pen, you know. I can I can just feel fouled by by my sin. Um, and in a situation like that, remembering that I've been washed clean in the waters of baptism may be the uh, the key towards really getting the benefit out of Jesus' death on the cross for me. Think yes, I I am filthy, but Jesus has washed me clean. Um, at another time, I may be struggling with more of a, a mental understanding um, of forgiveness, and there, reading the clear word of Scripture may clear up for me. You know, how could Jesus possibly forgive me? But there it is, right there in the Bible, that he really does forgive me. So sometimes it's more of a, a, a mind thing that's going on. Uh, then there are other times when um, you know, I may be struggling with the idea that Jesus forgives me personally. Um, and think about it. When, when I receive the Lord's Supper, well, when I hear the word, other people are hearing the same word. The same sound waves are going into their ears. And I could listen to it, and I could listen to the pastor saying, your sins are forgiven, and think, yeah, well, he's talking to those other people. But you can't say Jesus' body and blood is going to those other people when you can taste it in your own mouth. <laughs> Um, yes, they're getting it too, but you cannot deny I'm getting it. I am forgiven. This is for me. Um, so um, so with, with different circumstances, being troubled by our sins in different ways, God comes at us in these different ways to get his forgiveness across to us. We talked about that last week, but I, I just wanted to accent that again. Um, he knows us. I mean, he, 
he designed and built us. And consequently, he knows what it takes to get forgiveness into our lives. And he, by his choice, um, comes to us in all these different ways with the same message of love and forgiveness. Um, I don't think I said this last week. But if I did, stop me. But um, I know it's hard to stop me. But, um, you know, there are many different ways that you can say, I love you to someone. A couple days after Valentine's Day, you know, think about that. Um, my wife actually gave me two cards this year because um, one of them was just a little too funny, she thought, <laughs> and just a little too silly. Um, and so she wanted to have the mushy one there, too. Sounds like you. Um, <laughs> Well, but both of them communicated quite well. I got the message that she loved me out of both of them. Um, you know, well, sometimes you get the message, I love you, from a box of candy. And sometimes you get the message, I love you, from he vacuumed, you know? Um, or he did the dishes. Um, sometimes you get it from a mushy car, and sometimes you get it from a big extravagant, you know, three-day trip, you know. There's all kinds of ways that this could happen. Um, hopefully you don't uh, have to get the message just because he looks at you and says, <laughs> you know, and that's all you get out of Valentine's Day. Um, <laughs> Bah humbug or something. <laughs> Hopefully that's not it. But um, so, and so also God's message of love comes to us in many different ways. Um, but it's the same message. It's the same love. It's, it's just many, many facets of that same love. So if you, if you compare the um, catechism on the Lord's Supper with the catechism on, the, on baptism, you see these, these two questions in the middle parts two and three, really are the same thing. You know, um, What is the benefit of baptism? What is the benefit of the sacrament of the altar? Um, how can water do such great things? How can eating and drinking do such great things? And in both cases, the answer is essentially the same. How can eating and drinking do such great things? The same. Okay, you know, it's not just the eating and the drinking. It's the eating and the drinking the word of Christ that creates his presence there, and faith, trusting in that. Now, remember how I said this. Uh, my faith doesn't create Christ's presence there. It just determines whether or not it does me any good, or even potentially it harms me. So I've got the actual eating and drinking of the bread and the wine. I've got the presence of Christ by the power of his word. And I've got the faith that God has given me that trusts that I'm receiving the body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of all of my sins. That's kind of the mechanism that's operating there. And then finally, Luther gets to the question of um, who is worthy to receive the body and blood of Christ. Um, when I was a kid, I always figured that the reason we had the confession and absolution in the beginning of the service was to clean us up so we could come to communion. That was, that was kind of my impression of that. Um, and I was troubled by the fact that the confession and absolution came too early in the service because that left me you know, about 30 minutes to sin some more, <laughs> you know, like falling asleep during the sermon or, you know, <laughs> pinching my sister or whatever. I, I just was really troubled by that, that I wouldn't be clean when I came to communion. Um, but that's, that's not it. Um, worthiness to receive the sacrament um, is, um, is about trusting and believing in the words themselves. Luther says fasting 
and other bodily preparation can be fine outward training. But worthiness consists in believing the words given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Um, Luther points out that in, in the Middle Ages, uh, the church taught that you fasted before you came to the Lord's Supper. That, you know, you just didn't eat breakfast that day. You went to Mass um, with an empty stomach. Um, and, and Luther's reacting to that. Uh, the fasting doesn't make you worthy to receive the Lord's Supper. No kind of bodily preparation is the source of your worthiness. He says it can be fine outward training. Uh, Lutherans have never rejected the idea of fasting or other um, bodily disciplines. Um, you, can, um, you can make good use of bodily discipline. C.S. Lewis talks about this um, several different places. I don't know if you've ever read any of his works. Um, but if you, if you ever want a, a good companion to what we've talked about here, uh, get a hold of his book, Mere Christianity. C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity. Um, very good companion to what we've talked through here. Um, uh, he talks about like kneeling to say your prayers. Um, instead of just saying them as you sit in your chair and lie in your bed or something like that, he, he talks about kneeling. That there's um, that there you can you can make use of your human body to help you to focus and to concentrate on what you're doing. Um, I used to uh, fast on Tuesdays, um, and every time my stomach growled and, and I felt like I'd like to eat something. That reminded me to attend to my prayers and to think about what God had done for me. Um, I gave it up, not because it, um, well, I lost about 10 pounds that year that I did that. But um, I gave it up because I found that while I was fasting, I wasn't changing anything else about my day. I still kept the same schedule. I still worked just as hard. I just did it hungry. <laughs> and didn't really have, I had more reminders of what I should be doing, but I still didn't have any time to do what I should be doing. To, um, and so I, I quit doing it for that reason. But um, it, it can be uh, very helpful to, um, to do things in a bodily way that will remind you to focus on your devotions. But that's, um, but that doesn't make you better, you know? It doesn't mean that God is going to listen to your prayers better because you've been fasting or because you're kneeling or something like that. You don't get God's attention by doing those things. It's your attention that's really being worked on. So if you find that some kind of a, of, a, of a bodily discipline is helpful to you for your prayers and devotion, by all means, make use of it. But that's just a personal, individual choice. It works well for some people. It doesn't work at all for other people. And some people have experiences like me where it kind of works and it kind of doesn't, you know? Um, so uh, giving something up for lens is the same kind of thing. For years, I've given up sweets for Lent, but then I figured out this year, finally, that I just went right back to them after Lent, and I needed, instead of giving up something, I needed to um, just find a better way of dealing with food that I could keep up later. And I've been doing pretty fair so far. We'll see how it all turns out, but um, certainly not completely successful yet. But but being Lent, it's helping me to think about that, and in turn, thinking about that helps me to remember my devotional life, so it's a pretty good deal. All right, so what Luther says is that um, to be prepared for the Lord's Supper means to be a sinner, recognize that you're a sinner, 
be sorry for your sins, desire a different kind of life, and, um, and believe that Jesus actually gives you the forgiveness of sins. Um, that's the, the whole worthiness thing. Now, Tim was asking earlier um, about um, the way that different Lutheran churches deal with the question of who can come to the Lord's Supper. Um, you will encounter some Missouri Synod Lutheran churches, especially if you leave the state of Florida, um, where their teaching is that you have to be a Missouri Synod Lutheran or else you can't come to communion. And um, I have uh, I've really struggled with this over the years, especially when I was outside of the state of Florida, um, trying to determine why someone would teach that. I have no problem with the teaching that you shouldn't come to communion if you don't believe that Christ's body and blood is there for the forgiveness of your sins. That we find right there in the Bible. But to teach that you shouldn't come to communion in a Lutheran church if you're not a Lutheran, I'm like, okay, why? And as I've explored this, what I've come up with is that there are unfortunately Lutheran pastors out there who would say if you're not a member of our church body then you may not commune here even if you believe the same thing we believe you still can't commune here and what that boils down to is that they are um, exploiting a teaching opportunity. In other words, you can really get somebody's attention if you say you can't commune here. Um, you can say, you know what, you really need to think about um, that church that you do belong to um, that teaches differently than you believe. You need to deal with that fact that you, you believe differently than your church teaches. If you believe the same as we do, means you believe different than this other denomination, so you shouldn't be a member of that denomination. So, you know, you can get somebody's attention that way. Of course, you can also aggravate the fool out of them and anger them and miss the teaching opportunity, which happens, I believe, more often than the other. Um, but these, these pastors are just kind of hung up on that, and they seem to be, and, and it's hard to pin this down, they seem to be approaching it kind of from the idea of if you're <clears throat> here and don't actually belong to our church, you're somehow um, interfering with the perfect community of faith here. And I have trouble with that, because I'm not finding that perfection. Um, if I'm going to commune only with people who perfectly agree with me on everything, then it's going to be me and the mirror, and that's pretty well it. Um, so I, I really struggle with all of the arguments I've ever heard, and what really gets to me is that I've, you know, in, a, in my discussions, pointed out that the uh, catechism teaches that true worthiness consists in believing given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And I point out, you know, what we're going to look at in a minute, Luther's questions and answers for those who intend to come to the sacrament. And the answer that I've gotten is, well, that person may be a worthy communicant, just not here. And at that point, I just throw my hands up. I'm just completely befuddled by that. Um, so even within our church body, you have this strange thing going on. Um, I just say that to you know, warn you in case you move away from here someday that um, you, you might encounter this teaching that I just, I, I've spent 25 years trying to understand it and I still cannot get a hold of it. And we won't go into any more detail than that, but just, just so that you're aware. At our church, we have those blue cards. Someone who believes what 
the, the cards say there is certainly welcome to come and commune at our altar. Um, someone who doesn't would need to you know, do some thinking and praying and talking with folks before they would take communion. Um, Luther, in your catechism, I think it's on page 43, maybe, see if that's right. Um, there are um, is, uh, questions and answers for those who intend to go to the sacrament. Does that start on 43? Or, uh, 40. 40. Starts on page 40. Um, Luther really has a kind of decision tree flow chart thing going on there. Um, you know what I'm talking about. You have a, a question, and if the answer is yes, then you move on to the next question. But if the answer is no, it kicks you out of the system. Okay? If you answer yes to this next question, you move on to the following one. But if you answer no, it kind of you know sends you off down some other path. Um, let's just look through these questions really quickly, and you'll see what I'm saying. What's the what's Luther's first question? Do you believe that you are a sinner? Okay. If the answer is yes, you can go on towards communing. If the answer is no. You can't come to communion. And if you don't think you're a sinner, you're not going to come to communion. What's the next one? How do you know this? Yeah. Um, and Luther's answer is, of course, from the Ten Commandments. In other words, I know that I'm a sinner because I have failed to do what God says to do. Not because I just vaguely, generally feel kind of depressed or something, but my actual um, sins against God's commandment. What's the next question? Are you sorry for your sins? Yeah, if you answer no to that one, you certainly can't come to communion. <laughs> What's the next one? What have you deserved from God because of your sins? Yeah, if, um, if they... You know they're sitting on my chair in a basket. Do you want to carry those over? Yeah, I was walking along. Thank you so much, David. Um, what have you deserved if the answer is, oh... Not much, really. You know, it's not a big deal that I've sinned against the God who created the heavens and the earth. Then you're probably not really headed for communion. But if your answer is, I've deserved eternal death and separation from God, and that's the problem that I'm trying to then you move on to the next question, which is? Do you hope to be saved? Yeah, see, uh, Judas could have answered correctly the previous questions. <laughs> but, of course, Judas didn't hope to be saved. He despaired. And he went out and committed suicide instead. Uh, next question. In whom then do you trust? Yeah, if the answer is Buddha or Muhammad, then you're not coming to communion. But if the answer is in our dear Lord Jesus Christ, you see how this is working. You, you, you work your way through, and Luther is, is spelling out what faith it is that leads you to come to the Lord's Supper and receive the sacrament worthily. And as you go on through, he um, explores a little bit of the Trinity and so forth. Um, finally, he gets to the last three questions. I'm going to like, talk through that a little bit. Uh, someone read question 18. Finally, why did you wish to the sacrament? Yeah, what's driving you? What's, what's your motivation if you're an actor here? <laughs> Uh, well, they better not be an actor. That's a hypocrite, you know. That's what the word actor is in Greek, hypocrite. Um, but what, it, what is driving you to the sacrament? Um, and uh, the answer is that you want to obey Christ and receive the forgiveness of your sins, then you're moving on. 19? What should admonish and encourage a Christian to receive the sacrament frequently? Yeah. What... Um, what should be causing you to desire it more than just once in your life? Um, and, uh, of course, the answer is that we're, we're sinning all the time. You know, I receive communion four times every weekend at least um, in four different services. I need every one of them. <laughs> and then some, you know. Um, and then uh, question 20 is the one I really want to get to. But what should you do if you are not aware of this need and have no hunger and thirst for the sacrament? 
Yeah, what if you, you have no sense that you're really, you know, got a, a lifetime of struggle with sin? And Luther's answers um, hark back to, to um, some of his answers in the, in the Lord's Prayer and a couple of the petitions. Um, essentially, Luther says, start out by sticking your hand inside your shirt and see if you're still made out of flesh and blood. If you're still made out of flesh and blood, then read what the Bible says about flesh and blood people and how sin affects their lives. Um, secondly, he says, take a look around. Are you still in the world? And if you're still in the world, read what the Bible says about how the world tempts us to sin. And finally, Luther points out that uh, if you're still made out of flesh and blood, if you're still in the world, then the devil is going to be prowling around like a roaring lion, as the Bible says. So he says, read what the Bible says about how the devil tempts you. In other words, with all of these sources of temptation, our sinful flesh, the world around us, the devil himself, um, we are certainly going to be deeply involved in a struggle with sin in our lives and in need of God's forgiveness. And so we come to the Lord's table to receive that. Um, th these are, are excellent questions that I'd like you to you know, spend a little time with um, at home. And, uh, and for many years, um, very devout Lutherans would, uh, would use these consistently. I, I remember vividly in my first parish, there was an older couple in their mid-70s at the time um, that um, they, they had no children, um, but they did, because, you know, they kind of adopted children into their lives. They had several little headstones out at the cemetery from full-term stillbirths, but no children. But So, and they were this really a special couple. We just really loved them. And um, there was one Sunday when uh, there was kind of a mix-up at church, and they came to church ready for communion, and it wasn't there. And they got all frustrated, and later on they apologized to me for their frustration. Um, and it was my fault. I, we had made some kind of a change. Anyhow, but they said, you know, on uh, Sundays when there's communion, this they didn't have communion every Sunday at that church, we get up an hour early so that we can go over our catechism, go over Luther's 20 questions and answers with each other before we come. And they've been doing this ever since, you know, they were confirmed 60 some odd years ago. Um, this was just their devotional time to think about what it meant to be a sinner and to offend against God and his commandments. And, and how they cherished their dear Lord Jesus Christ and how important it was. They just, you know, really took some time. This is something that um, Christians today um, really struggle with, is actually taking enough time to get the benefit out of what we believe. Um, that's why things like retreats are so popular. Um, Unfortunately, we kind of live from one retreat to the next, you know. We go and we say, oh, yes, this is all true, and it's so wonderful, and I'm so glad I came on this retreat. And then we get back and say, and now i got to catch up, you know. <laughs> and we just go right back into that same place. So to the extent that you are able, and it requires making some important choices, um, sometimes difficult choices, I would encourage you to make good use of what it is that you do believe and, uh, and actually take some time with it and uh, prepare yourself. Um, in the hymnal, there are a number of resources for preparing yourself for communion. Um, obviously, when you get to church, the first thing is you want to kind of greet your friends and things like that. But, um, you know, you should be able to plump down in your in your seat and pull the, the hymnal out and open it up and if you just kind of bend your head over most people will recognize that you're preparing yourself for worship and you can take some of that time and if you find you just can't do that um, try it at home uh, you've got your catechism that's a good resource for you um, 
God deserves some attention. He deserves some time where we just set it apart, a time that we devote to him. And uh, I would encourage you to actually do that. Not just think, yeah, that's a good idea, and then go on. <laughs> I have that problem myself and can, can identify with it quite easily. There are a lot of things that are great ideas that I'm not doing. Um, I've got way more ideas than I seem to have time, but it's something we all can work on. So, well, let me just, like, a minute or two, if anybody's got any questions about the, the Lord's Supper, that what we've talked about here. Um, let me point out um, that uh, the bread that we use, um, you'll notice there's two different kinds of bread. We have a large piece for the words of institution for breaking, and it actually, in case you ever wondered, it breaks with little scored lines in it. That's why it usually breaks pretty straight, you see that. Um, yields 24 pieces if you need to know something like that. Um, and, uh, and then there are the little uh, wafers that are already individual. They have a stamped crucifix on them with the I-N-R-I, which stands for Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews in Latin. So that's, you know, the, the title above Jesus' name was written in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. Um, those little individual breads, <coughs> are actually stamped out of a large, like 30 inches by 24 or something like that piece that's baked. So they're, um, we are all eating from the same loaf, so to speak. Um, you, you, if you've imagined them baked individually, that's not the case, they're stamped out. It's unleavened bread, that is, there's no yeast in it because that's what they used at the Passover. And so Lutherans have consistently used unleavened bread. We use um, wine that we get by the case from the ABC liquor store, you know. Um, there's no special blessing over it or anything like that. Um, Jesus and his disciples got their wine from a local wine merchant, I'm sure, and there was nothing extraordinary about it. Um, everything would have been kosher at that table, that is, it would have met the Jewish dietary laws, um, but uh, nothing, it would have been, like I say, straight from the marketplace. Um, we offer communion with uh, either the chalice or the little individual cups simply because um, some people prefer it one way and some people prefer it the other, and we don't want the method of getting the wine to your lips to be a problem. So, you know, we just, that should not be something that causes difficulties for people. Um, in the middle of the little individual cup trays are several um, glasses of grape juice, we use the white grape juice so it's easy to distinguish it for people who have uh, problems with wine or with alcohol. Um, just as a little side note, um, grape juice was actually invented in the 1870s by Dr. Welch of Welch's fame, um, who was a strict teetotaler and he was troubled by the fact that the only alcohol he ever drank was in communion at church. And so he found that in a, in a process similar to pasteurization of milk, that he could take the crushed grape juice, which would immediately start to ferment just from the natural yeast. I mean, you crush a grape, you got wine. It's already happening. The fermentation process has already started. But he found that by um, kind of pasteurization process that the yeast could be killed and, and the fermentation would be stopped in that uh, grape juice. Um, 
So um, uh, it's it's and that then became very popular among those denominations who teach that you can't drink alcohol. Now the Bible doesn't teach that, but there are some denominations that teach that as though the Bible taught it, which is kind of hard to figure out when you've got passages like Paul telling Timothy to drink some wine for his stomach and Jesus changing water into wine and stuff like that. And you'll get people who say, oh, Jesus didn't use wine at the Last Supper because wine has yeast in it, and consequently they wouldn't have had wine there. Well, there's a couple problems with that. Number one, they didn't know what caused the fermentation process. They didn't understand that it was yeast that caused that, so they wouldn't have connected that with that. The other thing is that at that time of year, there were no fresh grapes. <laughs> It just didn't exist, at, you know, in, in mid-March, just wouldn't have been there. Consequently, you couldn't have just grape juice, because as soon as you squeeze a grape, it starts fermenting. Um, so this um, crazy teaching that, that Jesus used grape juice, grape juice literally was invented. You may think, oh, squeeze a grape, you got grape juice. No, you've got wine. <laughs> grape juice was invented in the 1870s. So to teach that you should be using that for communion is really, or that you must use that for communion is really an odd teaching. Um, we, uh, we, what we're using there is wine whose fermentation has been stopped for the sake of those who have trouble with fermentation. Um, now you'll get some pastors that, oh, you can't use grape juice. get a little puzzled by people um, but uh, at any rate um, and anything else in there. Um, studies have shown that the silver chalice with wine with alcohol in it at the level that uh, the alcohol is there um, simply as far as we know is not capable of passing germs on to other people and causing you to get sick. But there are some people for whom that's just a yucky thought that they would drink after somebody else. Um, so, and like I said, we just, you know, Jesus used one cup and passed it amongst his disciples. We use one cup, passed it around, but if people are troubled by that, they can have the little plastic cups and you know, we just don't care. Get the wine to your lips. <laughs> That's the important thing. All right, well, I really have to run. It's been great to have class with you guys. I really enjoyed